You're listening to Crowning Ignorant Kings, a podcast for citizens with like minds who love God, follow Christ, and have a desire to be an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven on earth. We are John and Charlene Donaldson. We're teachers building a kingdom community. Thank you again for joining us. Now let's adjust our crown. kingdom power of self-government. I want everyone to listen very carefully. The kingdom power of what? Self-government. Our focus is rediscovering the original principle of personal leadership. Self-government. The original purpose and principle of personal leadership self-government God never created institutional government that's a shock when God created the human race he did not create institutional government there is no record of God establishing government. And this is very serious. Let me give you a couple of things to write down. Number one, the greatest and most perfect government on planet Earth, which everybody is looking for, happens to be a surprise. The greatest and most successful government on earth is self-government. It is the ultimate government. As a matter of fact, the original purpose and plan of God for mankind was self-government. Self-government is the reason why God created you. In essence, the ultimate government on earth the premier government, the, the most perfected government on earth is self-government. And the further we move away from self-government, the more destruction we will experience. The problem is no one can legislate self-government. You understand? So please write this down, especially the young leaders in here. God never intended mankind to be governed externally. Oh, this is so important. God never intended for you to have a legislation group of people telling you what to do. He never intended a Senate to debate how you should live. God never intended external government. I am living proof that self-government works. Point number six, the ultimate goal of God for mankind is to eradicate external law. Now this is very critical for our country right now. All countries suffering social decay is a result of the lack of self-government. People are breaking laws personally. And the breaking of personal law produces public chaos. So we really don't have a, a, a community problem. We have individual problems. 
that affect the community. Do you understand where I'm going? So, God wants to eradicate external law. Now, I'm going to explain this in a few minutes why this is so important. Because God's original government is expressed when he gave Adam his mandate. Let's read this. Very important. Adam was never given written law. That may sound simple, but... <laughs> Do you know that there was no written law until Moses? From Adam to Moses, nothing was on paper. God never intended for you to have a written constitution. God never intended for there to be any courts with judges and no prisons. God's plan was never to have written law never gave Adam such secondly Adam was never given external government God took our forefather Adam he put him in the garden of Eden with all these resources and then God says work now the word work is important here I you know it was I researched that years ago and I was shocked that the word work is the word ergon. It actually means to become. It doesn't mean to do something. He was telling Adam, become yourself. What an instruction. We normally talk about going to work. That's probably why we got an employment problem. If you go to work, you could be sent back home. But no one can stop you from becoming something. There's a difference. So, he gave Adam all of these resources. Then he says, become. And then he told Adam, cultivate. Not a big word in Hebrew. It means to manage and maximize resources. To manage and maximize resources. Cultivate. Then he says, protect. God. That means safeguard, not just what's in the garden, but safeguard what makes it function. You know, our governments are finally agreeing with that instruction. Uh, that we are finally coming against things like oil spills. You know, we, we're trying to guard nature, finally. But God told Adam, guard the garden. Not just the material, but the laws by which it functions. So he never gave Adam external government. He gave Adam instruction and expected Adam to carry them out. Now, I want to read Genesis 2 verse 15. Uh, the first encounter Adam is having. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work it, take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Please note the word knowledge of. For when you eat from it, you will die. Apparently... God's plan for you was never to know evil. He didn't say evil didn't exist. But he never wanted you to know it, experience it. He always wanted you to know only what was good. It is the knowledge of evil that makes you evil. You guys wonder why God used to say, you know, don't fornicate. But I got married. And I was married as a virgin. And when I got married, and my wife and I had intercourse, I realized why God said that. Because once you activate an appetite, oh, you're laughing. This is serious business. See, if you never activated it, you don't want it. If you don't know evil, evil is no problem. And that's why when you come out of sin, God used the word self-control. Self-control. Why? Because that appetite going to fight you to the grave. You got to govern it. Do not touch that tree. Why? I don't want you to know both good and evil. Because the day you do that, he says, you will die. Apparently, God has come to the conclusion that once you know good and evil, evil tend to win. I mean, you need the grace of God to overcome evil. Self-govern yourself, Adam. Now, I want you to notice something about God. 
God's therefore primary assignment for Adam was management. I want you to write this down. The principal assignment of mankind is leadership dominion over earth's resources. God created you to have dominion over the resources of earth. Secondly, the responsibility of mankind is the management of earth's resources. Don't just dominate it, but manage it, God says. Thirdly, God's divine goal for you was the extension of the culture of heaven to earth. Why? Heaven is an orderly place. Orderly place. You know, we had someone who went to heaven and took some pictures and came back. You all remember that? His name is John. John took photographs and he put them in this book called the book of Revelation. And John said when he arrived there, everything was in perfect order. Around the throne, you know, 24 elders on one side and the other side. And there's, you know, all these different angels and there's these sects of different angels. And there was the throne of God and there was the river and there was and all this stuff. John says it was so beautiful, he was overwhelmed. It was decently in order. By the way, uh, the difference between a garden and a bush is order. That's all. Both of them got bush. Am I right? What makes a garden a garden is what? Order. Yeah, all of them got trees, but the garden is orderly. So when the Bible says God put Adam in a garden, it didn't mean he put him in a place with vegetables and, you know, tambourine. It means that he put him in a place that was orderly. And then he says, now multiply this spot and tell the whole earth is like this. Governing is about order. Write that down. And God says, Adam, I want you to make earth just like heaven. Heaven is orderly. Everything is in place. It is beautiful. God loves order. All things must be done decently and in order according to the will of God. God loves order. Management. That leads to my last point. Dominate the earth through work. What is work? Becoming yourself. That means you were born with a gift that's supposed to bring order to the earth. When you find what you were born to do, it brings order to resources. Let me explain. God's strategy. Genesis 2. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. And it tells us why. Because there was no rain. Why? Because God had not yet sent rain on the earth. There was no rain. Why? The rain would have caused the plants to grow out of the earth. God was ready for progress, development. He was ready for things to explode. But he withheld the rain. And it tells us why. Because there was no man to work the ground. God had a problem with management. He didn't want growth without management. He didn't want development without management. He didn't want things to just grow. You know, the difference between a forest and a garden is one of them is managed. God doesn't like bush, apparently. He liked garden. When you are chaotic, you repel resources. When you organize your life, you attract them. Can I put it another way? You want to write this down. This is very important. And that is, number one, management is the primary goal of mankind. Number two, whatever you fail to manage, you will lose. Number three, God's primary measure of trusting you with material is management. And number four, God will give to whoever effectively manages. And number five, management attracts resources. And the big one, number six, God will not give you what you pray for, only what you can manage. God heard your prayer all last year. I want a million dollars. God said, I heard you. I heard you. But you can't manage tithing out of a hundred dollars. Oh God, I need a ten million dollars. God said, ten million? You can't manage your paycheck yet. In other words, don't pray for what you cannot manage. God will protect things from you. I'm speaking from my own personal experience. The more I am managing the pennies, God trusts me with dollars. Amen. And the more I manage the dollars, he trusts me with the hundreds. And when I manage the hundreds, he trusts me with the thousands. When I manage the thousands, he trusts me with the millions. In other words, God trusts you based on your management, not your prayer requests. You fast and you pray and you wonder why God's not responding. God's watching some other things. You ask God for a new house and you don't keep the one you're living in clean. 
You ask God for a car, and God says, you don't keep the motorbike clean. In other words, he checks management before he releases resources. It's not the request, it's the management ability he watches. Let me quote Jesus. If you cannot be trusted with little, who will trust you with more? In other words, it's so important for you to understand that management is more important than prayer. Because management determines whether your prayer gets answered. If you cannot be faithful over other people's property, who will give you property of your own? I'm quoting Jesus. If you cannot be faithful over what? Other people's property. The reason why God gives you a job is not because you're supposed to be there for the rest of your life. He sends you on other people's job to see how you manage other people's property. That includes the printing machine of those people, the paper clips you take home without asking, the pens you steal. He's watching everything. Going to work late, stealing other people's lunch hours. Lying, say you're sick and staying home. God said, you can't manage the other people's time. How can I give you your own business? I want my own business. God said, you can't even keep a job. The reason why I gave you other people's property is to watch you to see if you can manage your own first. So once you prove you can manage theirs, then you know I'll trust you with your own, he says. Can you handle other people's money? Lawyers, contractors, don't get quiet on me now. Spending other people's money, bankers, tellers. Food store workers, warehouse managers, what are you taking home? God's watching everything. And if you can't manage other people's cans of beans in the warehouse, God will make sure you never own your own company. Management. Can I suggest to you then that you were created to solve a problem? Now, let me just say this very quickly. You were born to solve a problem, and you are God's response to a need that he created. In other words, you are the answer to a question God knew they would ask in your generation. Everyone came to earth to manage a problem, to solve a problem for humanity. You exist because you are the fulfillment of one of God's desires. You are the assignment in your generation. I was born to solve a problem in the world. So were you. I'm not better than you. Not, I'm not a superior. I just found my problem. And my job is to help you find your problem. You were not born just to make a living, pay bills and die. You were born to actually solve a problem on earth. And you are the solution. By the way, you get paid for the problems you solve. Write that down quick. You see, you don't work really for money, you know. You work for solutions. And then people pay you for solutions. Once you find a problem, you found your wealth. I'm hearing all these layoffs taking place and layoffs. And I'm sitting there going, boy, these people are going to go crazy because that was their life. If your job is your life, I mean, that's your life, then you got to really ask God for revelation fast. Say it with me, I am necessary. I am necessary. Say it loud. Shout it loud. In other words, you are not a mistake. You came to earth and we need you. Whatever you carry, we need. We have to help you find it though. You were born to solve a problem. And if you never find that problem, the problem still exists. Yes. The graveyard is filled with people who never solved the problem they were born to solve. And one of my major jobs in life is to help you find it. This is what the ministry is about. The Bible says he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. For what reason? To train the saints for what? The work of their ministry. To help you find where you're supposed to administrate. What you're supposed to do. That's my job. I can't make you wealthy. I can't make you everything else. I'm going to show you your gift. Help you find your ministration. Once you find it, then you what? You add to the body. You build up the body, the Bible says. Each joint supplies. I like that. Each joint supplies. That means whatever you're supposed to supply the body, we are missing if you don't supply it. You're not a mistake. I put this then to you that Moses is an example of solving a problem. You become valuable based on the problem you solve. Moses solved the problem of slavery. David solved the problem of Goliath. Uh, <laughs> please, do not ask God to remove every Goliath you meet. Stop praying for deliverance from your success. Do you understand? When the problem shows up, don't ask God to move it. The problem shows up to introduce you to yourself. 
If there was no Goliath, there'd be no King David. Can you imagine that? That giant was his ticket to his greatness. Tell your neighbor, don't fight it, kill it. <laughs> Stop trying to run away from the key to your greatness. The problems you're going to meet this week have been sent to give you value. David was not important until he killed Goliath. That's right. Your value goes up when the problems are solved. Are you with me, Doc? Yeah. So when you go back to your job and you see some difficulties, don't run from them. Embrace them. Tell them, welcome to your greatness. I'm about to kill a giant. Amen. By the way, you are never remembered for the things you avoided. You are remembered for the things you survived. Joseph solved the problem of dreams. Eh? Pharaoh had a what? He had an economic crisis in Egypt. Who solved it? Joseph. Who was he? A prisoner. Sometimes the solution is in jail. And when you find your problem and you solve it, you'll go from prison to prince. It's the solution that makes you valuable, not your location. The demand upon my life is directly tied to the problems I realize I have to solve. Third world leadership problems. That, that demand was created by the solution that I keep supplying. Don't look for money. Please, don't look for money. Money follows solutions. Why do you think Bill Gates is so rich? <laughs> Computers used to be as big as this room. Did you know that? Yeah, Bill Gates used to work for IBM when they used to do DOS. Boy, I hate that stuff. I couldn't remember all them, you know, formulas. And Bill Gates developed Microsoft in IBM. Took it to the board. And the board said, it'll never work. So he resigned from IBM, went to his garage and built a computer with the software. And every IBM computer now carries his software. It could have been theirs, but they couldn't see beyond their own tradition. And what did he do? He solved a problem. Richest man in the world. Your leadership is in the problem you were born to solve. Write this down, please. Daniel solved the problem of administration. You know what the Bible says about Daniel? It says that King Nebuchadnezzar promoted him to secretary of state because of the excellency of his work. He solved the problem of administration in Babylon and was promoted to the top position. What problem are you solving? Esther solved the problem of genocide. Remember, they were about to kill all the Jews. And she went in there and she said, I'm going to solve this problem. And today we can't forget that young lady because she solved a problem. I wonder if there's some young kids in the Bahamas who are about to get destroyed by sex or by by some kind of a prostitution and there's a young woman who's supposed to save them maybe your greatness is in the problem right in your neighborhood and we're so busy trying to pay light bills and water bills we walk past the problem every day that's supposed to make us great I find out years ago if you want to be great look for problems make a note of this please this is very important Jesus solved the problem of sin that's why he's so famous. He solved the most important problem on earth. Sin and death. I follow him because I'm scared of death. I know, I know you all are not a fake me. I'm scared of death. I won't come back. So I think I better follow the fella who solved that problem. Anybody with me? Praise the Lord. You know, he rose from the dead. I'm going to go with him. Now Muhammad, I know about him. Confucius, I hear about him. Buddha, I know. But this brother, he rose from the dead. The number one fear of humans is death. And this man solved it. His value is in what he did. Write this down. Every problem is a business. I hope we can get this revelation. I am so scared of what's happening in our regions where we have become so dependent on government to meet our needs that we become helpless when the government cannot. May God have mercy on us. As a matter of fact, what we've actually created is the government has become the economic parent of the citizen. To the point where we don't even think anymore. We just want to be slaves to a governmental machinery. It's called employment. 
And so most of the governments of our region, they actually run their political program on promising you employment. God never gave Adam a job. Secondly, he never gave Adam anything. He put everything in the things around him. God never gave Adam a chair. And I'm sure the brother to sit down sometime. God never gave Adam a bed, never gave Adam a table. Why? He hid them in the trees. See, employment prevents you from seeing the table in the tree. That's why those of us in our post-colonial countries, we always struggle with poverty and employment and depending on external investors because we've been conditioned not to see the table in the tree. We'd rather buy the table from Miami rather than make it out of the tree. Work. Become. Everyone who's ever been successful, solve the problem. You all remember Miami basketball team, the Heat? So they say, brother, we hear you could play. You want a few million dollars? You got a gift and we got a problem. Everybody say gift? Yes. Problem. problem. Write that down. You were born with a gift to solve a problem. When the problem meets the gift, wealth is the result. Don't work for money. I'm telling you, money follows solutions. Spend the next three weeks thinking about what I'm teaching right now. I want you to sit down the next three weeks because you got one year about to leave you. You can let the next year be like this one. Staggering, wandering through life, trying to figure out whether you should retire. Let me tell you something. You better start thinking beyond your job. What is my gift? What is my strength? What is my uniqueness? What do I have that I can give the world? Let me go find the problem. Everybody say, be a business. I think this is the key, you know. God wants you to be a business. <laughs> Every problem is a business. Business is born when the solution to a problem is discovered. You know why McDonald's and Pizza Hut and those guys make so much money? You know why Burger King is so consistently successful? Because they solve a problem. It's called fast food. You don't got to go there and spend no two hours and put a napkin on your lap and candle. You go in there for two seconds. Matter of fact, they don't want you in there longer than 30 minutes. Why? No pad on the chairs, hard table, and they give you tissue, not cloth. And they give you paper to eat out of. In other words, don't you stay here. Why? They got a design. Get out of here fast. Why? The next person come in. Why? We're solving a problem. It's called what? Fast food. See, people didn't have time to catch breakfast for no two hours. They, matter of fact, they saw another person. They said, just drive up to the window. Yeah. You ain't going to come with a car no more. Drive up, you know, with one Big Mac bomb. Go on with that. Boom, gone. <laughs> they solve a problem. You keep putting the money there. Keep putting the money there. Why? They solve the problem. We lack people studying problems. <laughs> Go look for a problem. Write this down, please. Don't seek a business, seek a problem. Adam, here's the garden. And it's full of oil and onyx, and there is water, there are trees. It's up to you to see them. God gave you and I the ability and the gifts to solve a problem. And that means whoever solves problems become wealthy. I think this is really the heart of it, you know. Uh, I look at people in the church. I can look around, in the, you know, doc, Dr. Russell back there. Orthodontist, right? It's a big word, orthodontist. Okay. Now, he, he's solving a problem. You can't fix your own teeth. So you go to him, and really, he don't really take your money, you know. He simply solves a problem. You leave the money there. <laughs> right? He tells you, if you want me to solve your problem, this is the cost to solve your problem. So he solves the problem, and then you give him the money. So he's not really working for money. He's solving problems. Now his job is very important. He got to now think about some other problems because you see things changing. So he got to go keep studying new problems related to the, his, his, his area of work and then make sure he's ready to solve them too. Nothing is worse than solving a problem that doesn't exist. <laughs> Your solution could run out of style. 
Hey boys, they stay current. That's right. You got to stay up to date because you got to keep checking how the problems are changing so the solutions could be adjusted. Yeah? There's some mechanics in here who ain't got no job. Why? The car they used to fix 20 years ago don't exist. The engine change? Hmm? Architects in here ain't make no money. Why? Them brothers don't use no pencil no more. They hit them computers. Bum, 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 bum. They make house in two seconds. You won't spend an hour drawing something, fellas, do it in two seconds. You got to adjust yourself. Solutions are filled with wealth. Am I coming through? This is why it's important for you to discover your leadership. Write this down. Business are all around you. Why? Because problems are all around you. If I can just get you to think this way, then those who were laid off by the hotel this week would get a revelation that they can't lay you off of your solution. See, your work and your jobs are different. You know that. Your job is what they pay you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. Your job is your skill. Your work is your gift. You can be fired from your job. You can't be fired from your work. It's like trying to fire a bird from flying. <laughs> if you tell a bird, go away, he takes flight with him. Come on, give God a praise right there. You see, your gift goes with you. When I discovered my gift, I discovered I'll never be poor again. Why? Because poverty depends on what people think about you and your value of yourself. But when you have your gift, it doesn't matter where you land. Bam! You could operate because your gift came with you. Life is bigger than your career. Your life is your call. And your calling always has life in it. Businesses are all around you. I want to encourage you, write this down. You were born with the seed of your business trapped on the inside. Your seed is your gift. Your gift is your leadership. You were born to lead in that area of gifting. And when you discover your gift, you discover your assignment, you discover your business. Every human being is a business person. Every human being. Do you know how many times I feel like eating guava duff and can't find that? Why, why, why don't someone solve that problem? How come no one solves it? I go in the food store, I'm looking for guava duff. You know guava duff in the freezer? Why? Because some behavior, I don't know, I don't know. They just, I don't know. Solve it. <laughs> There's a young man in this church, he's probably here this morning. He solved the problem of cow chowder. He bought something to me to taste three years ago. He said, Pastor Miles, I want to produce cow chowder. I heard your teaching, he says. So he bought me and my wife this cone chowder, and I ate this cone chowder. He had yellow cone chowder, red cone chowder, white cone chowder. His father taught him the recipe. I ate that thing. I said, man, listen, you got to find a way to package this. He came back with a plastic package three weeks later. He says, I found a way to package it and, you know, to, to keep it. And you, he said, if you, if you freeze it when it's hot, then it stays. It can last for three months. Okay, good. Do you know that it's super value? You can buy it now. Frozen and hot. He solved the problem. I'm still trying to find boiled fish. <laughs> Can anybody just package boiled fish for me, please? Man, when I come on these long trips, I'm looking for something hot and I'm ready to go. Just dump it in the pot, let's go. Yeah, you all thinking? Yeah, man. And you could buy guava from the can now. You can't tell me out of season. You can buy them in the can. You can, you can fool us. Put it in the dough, let's go. Even the visitors looking for guava duff. Write this down, please. You, whatever you were created to do and become, you possess it now. That means that whatever you were born to be is within you. God never places your future outside of you. Wherever you go, you carry it with you. Flight goes with the birds. Swim goes with the fish. Trees go with seeds. Your gift goes with you. In other words, whatever you were predestined to do is already prepared within you. And you came to this planet with your future trapped on the inside. I'm glad for that because no one really controls your future. It's inside you, Paul. And all these years, the, the, the hidden stuff is still there. Maybe God sent some of you to this meeting just to reconnect you one more time Amen. to your real self. Amen. Tell your neighbor, you ain't saying nothing yet. Amen. Come on, say it like you believe it. You ain't saying nothing yet. Amen. Tell your neighbor, I'm going to manifest before I die. Amen. You're going to be glad you sat next to me. Amen. Give God a hand for the manifestation of gifts. It will come to pass. <laughs> Hallelujah. If people knew who you really were, they'd treat you differently. Huh? I mean, David's brothers cursed him. He came to bring them lunch. They had no idea he was the champion. 
Joseph's brother. They call him old dreamer. Stupid. They tore his clothes off. He, in him, was the guy who was going to save their life years later. You don't know who you're sitting next to. Tell your neighbor, you better shake my hands right now. Congratulate me. Congratulations, man. Congratulations. Whatever you're going to become, congratulations right now. I, give God a hand for wealth. It's coming. It's coming. You don't know who you're sitting next to. Tell your neighbor, I ain't dead yet. <laughs> as long as you ain't dead, there's something left on the inside. Can I hear an Amen. Give God a praise one more time. You are a great person with something trapped on the inside. You were sent to earth to release your potential. You were sent to earth to make a deposit. You didn't come here just to suck up oxygen. You came here to leave a legacy. Everything in creation was created with a gift. Everything. And a gift is the inherent capacity to fulfill function. In other words, whatever you were born to do, the ability exists now, my son. Don't ever question your ability if you discover your assignment. God will never demand what he didn't supply. A gift can never be learned. It can only be refined. That's why going to college doesn't give you success. Getting a degree don't make you successful. Because a college can never give you a gift. You take your gift to college to polish it. That's why people go to college, study for four years, and still broke. Why? Because they shine the wrong thing. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't go with their gift in their head, and they studied the wrong subject, and now they hate what they studied. There are people who got a degree in the wrong thing. All that money you spent in the wrong subject. Because you didn't know your gift. And these, these last two are very important. The gift is the source of value to the created thing. Oh, please hear me. You know what makes oxygen so important? It gives us life. Hmm? You know what makes the sun so important? It gives us gamma rays, ultraviolet rays, that provide chlorophyll for the plant to give us oxygen. So the sun is very important, it's valuable. In other words, your value is in your function. If you don't feel valuable, it could be because we don't know why you are here. <laughs> you know, you here all these years, we ain't know why. You taking up space. <laughs> you wondering why we walking past you because we don't know why you here. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can't ignore something if you know its value, and its value is in what? Its function. Yes. Amen. I mean, when your car is on E. I know you want to drive past that gas station, but that gas station got you. You got to pull into that fuel station. Why? Because it has something you need. That's right. The value is based on the purpose of the thing. Why were you born? What is your gift, your management gift? Purpose determines your value. Now, Proverbs 18, a very common verse, it says well, out loud, read. A man's gift makes room for him and will bring him before great kings. You know, I kept wondering, why do I end up in these high places? Not because they like me. My gift. And by the way, let me, let me just warn you too. When you start being notarized for your gift, don't take it seriously. Because it ain't you they're interested in. You know, humility mm -hmm. is sensibility. Yes. You stay humble because you know you don't come to me because you like me. You like what I got. That's all. <laughs> when you go to a mango tree, you don't go to the leaves. You don't care about the branches. You don't even look at the bark. You go, <laughs> you go for what? The fruit. Tell your neighbor, bear your fruit and I'll come to you. See, when you discover your gift, you even ain't got to look for followers. They find you. People bring their monies to you when you find your gift and start delivering it. A man's gift makes room for him. Makes room for him. That means it forces space in the universe. Your gift makes room for you. They can't ignore you. Maybe today the Lord sent you to this meeting. Again, to reconnect you to yourself, the one you lost. Go back, find yourself. Study yourself. This, 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 uh, this thing about business, business is born when the solution is discovered. Your value comes from that solution. 
So don't seek business, seek solutions and seek problems and then you begin to find attraction to your value. Whoever solves problems become wealthy. This is the heart of it. So businesses are all around us. The more problems in the world, the more business that exists. You know, when 9-11 took place some years ago, the airplanes hit that thing. Man, they shut down all the airlines. And boy, my first thought was, I wish I could be the company that invented the machine that you got to stand in and turn around like this. I mean, the fellows who build that machine now, billions of dollars. The little one, oh Lord, please let me make that one. Right. A trillion of them for $50 each. Problems create business. Oh, don't miss next week. The Lord showed me that the first thing he gave you is the most important thing you have. And that is your, your intellect. Your brain. Image means your intellectual capacity to think like God. 90% of success is in your head between your ears. 10% is in your hands. You don't become successful because you work hard. It's because you work smart. Smart people hire hard working people. <laughs> you know, Krishna came here and we, we had Hog Island. He's our paradise. We call it Hog, he call it paradise. We treat it like pig, he treat it like a resort. What happened? He hired us. How do you see? He saw a solution on Hog Island. My God. My Griffin came here years ago, flew over the garbage dump on Hog Island. He said, I like this island. The government sell it for almost nothing. Nah, boy, they regret that, eh? That island worth almost, what, $5 billion? It used to be a whole garbage dump. It took a foreigner to see what we had. Are we still there? Are we still trying to, to buy chair or are we going to make it of the tree, see? What are we going to do, dog? Every problem is a business. I'm going to close on this verse. Sow your seed in the morning. You know who wrote this? The richest man that ever lived. Normally, I would suggest to people, if you want to be successful, don't take advice from a failure. This guy was the richest man that ever lived. I figure you better listen to the fella. Here's what he says. <laughs> Sow your seed in the morning. And in the evening, let not your hands be idle. He tells you why. Because you know not which one might prosper you. Whether this one or that one or both. Lord have mercy. This is good advice. Let me explain what he means. He says in the morning, go to work. On your job. In the evening, work on your own business. See there? In the morning, go to your job. In the evening, work on your work. In the morning, go to the job. In the evening, don't watch TV. Do you know that your future is after 5 p.m.? Please listen to me before I go. See, you understand. You build your life after you go home. Because from 9 to 5, you don't own your life. Think for a minute. You got a 9 to 5 job, that means you cannot grow between 9 and 5. You can't work on your future between 9 and 5. You're building someone else's. You got to work after 5. After 5 o'clock, start thinking, dreaming, working, developing. Why? He says, in the evening, let not your hands be idle. Now he tells you why. Because you know not which one will succeed. Now the folks who were just later this week from the hotel. If they only had the morning seed. They're in trouble. I'm talking to some of you. You need to go home and start working after 5. Life begins after 5 p.m.
your life. Sometimes people joke me, you know, they joke me and say, but Pastor Miles, you don't have to sleep. You're right. Most of the time, I am working between, you know, 6 and 2, 3 a.m. 4 a.m. is easy for me to go to work. I'm, I'm just going to bed at 4 a.m. My wife will tell you, but because you can't, you can't build your future by going to bed for 8 hours. 8 hours times 7 is 56. That means you sleep two days every week. <laughs> no, this is a serious business. You never thought about it. You sleep two days every week. <laughs> Most successful people build their lives while you are sleeping. Sow your seed in the morning. And in the evening, let your hands be idle. You see those books that Dr. Richard wrote? He didn't write them between 9 and 5. He probably up late in the night working on, you know, all the, all, plus a day, working hard. You, this, I want to talk about me, oh my God. To produce a global book, man, I mean, research. You can't go to bed nine o'clock. So you'll see it in the morning, and after five, start working, he says. Both may succeed, you know. You don't know which one. Boy, Bahamians love five o'clock. Get out of my way. Where are you going? Home. That's about it. Just home. Just, we're so busy going home, we don't go to our destiny. Be a different person. Don't be a normal person, please. Let today be the last day you allow TV to destroy your life. Shut it off. Turn them talk show off. Only listen to the one I own. That's it. Period. <laughs> In other words, you got to be careful how you consume your time on your off time. Your down time is actually your up time. You grow in your down time. You can't read a book between nine and five on a man's job. You can read a book after five. So read a book. Study. You know, people, people come over. Drop in, in. Don't drop in on me no more. Don't drop in. See, people are dropping. I just drop in to see how you're doing. Hey, hey, excuse me. And you stay there for two hours talking, gossip. These people poor, you poor. This is a bad conversation. I'm serious about this. We spend hours with people who ain't going nowhere, ain't doing nothing, and they ain't got nothing to help you. Clap your hands. Say, God, I'm going to change right now. You got to decide what you're going to do with your time in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I say, Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. hallelujah. Today, self govern yourself. Self govern yourself. Take a deep breath. In the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you for reminding us that we were born to be successful created to have plenty and Lord we've allowed our cultures to destroy that we repent we change our thinking right now repeat after me Heavenly Father you are my father you are our father your name and your character is perfect let your kingdom thinking come let your will for my life become in my life just like it is in heaven whatever you dreamt of me let it come to pass whatever you thought of when you created me that's what I want and I know that your thoughts for me are good and to have a future and an expected end and today I rededicate myself to your will in my life I surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ who paid for my salvation and I dedicate my life to fulfilling your will in my generation reveal to me my gift come on pray that one more time reveal to me my gift one more time reveal to me my gift and show me the problem I was born to solve let the next six weeks Lord be a weeks of discovery and I promise you I will obey your laws 
in Jesus name give God a big praise and he answers prayer thank you for listening to crowning ignorant kings where we are cultivating a kingdom community please sign up for our podcast download like and share look for us on your social media platforms if you'd like to reach out to us please send us an email at crowningignorantkings at gmail.com.